Have you ever wondered why functions are such a big deal in high school and college level math? They're everywhere. They've got a bunch of different names. Linear functions, quadratic functions, cubic functions, polynomial functions, rational functions. What else? Exponential functions, logarithmic functions, trigonometric functions, and all sorts of combinations of these various kinds of functions. They're everywhere. What do we do with them? We plug numbers into them. We think about domains and ranges. We graph them. If you know calculus, we can also differentiate them and integrate them. For what purpose? Why is there such a big emphasis on functions? Well, in this video, which is about solving a certain problem in probability, I want to argue also that functional thinking, thinking about functions and plugging numbers in and graphing them, is really important for one thing because it can help you solve infinitely many problems all at once. That's a pretty amazing thing. You can solve infinitely many problems all at once. And more importantly, secondly, more importantly, they can help you think about the nature of the solution. By making a graph, you can understand what's going on with the solution as certain quantities change. Okay? So you can see this is what I'm calling actuarial exam 1 slash P prep, which is P stands for probability. If you don't know what an actuary is or you don't want to be an actuary, it's okay. Just focus on probability. The probability content of this video is fairly complicated. You need to know some probability to understand what's going on here fully. But even if you don't fully understand probability, I hope you can watch this and appreciate the power of functional thinking. So this is related to what I did in my last video, video number 13. It's a generalization of what I did in that video. SOA sample question number 25. SOA stands for Society of Actuaries. They have sample questions online that you can find, and this is question number 25 in a generalized form. It's about disease testing, which doesn't sound so nice, but it's important. You can have blood tests that test for disease, and you should realize in the background here that sometimes you can get a, a true positive test result, meaning it's saying you have the disease, it comes back positive, and it's true. It really is correct. You do have the disease, but also you can come back with a false positive. It could say you have the disease, but maybe you really don't. Okay, blood tests are not perfect. So that's the background, and let's read the details now. This says a blood test indicates the presence of a particular disease with a probability TP, TP standing for true positive, when the disease is actually present. So when it's known ahead of time that the person has the disease, this test is going to come back saying, yes, they do have the disease with probability TP. Now, probabilities are numbers between 0 and 1, which indicate the likelihood of something. So you would hope TP is close to 1, close to 100%. In video number 13, it turned out that TP was 95% or 0.95. The same test, however, indicates the presence of the disease with probability FP, standing for false positive, when the disease is not actually present. Okay, and you would hope that would be a small number. FP is a, a probability that when you do not have the disease, the test says you do. That's a false positive. In video 13, you can see that probability was 0.5%, one half of 1% as a decimal, that's 0.005. But here in this video, I'm treating it as an unknown, a variable, you might say. Furthermore, the probability that a randomly chosen person in the whole population has the disease, I'm calling X. X is going to be my main variable, so to speak, for my function that is going to be the solution to this problem. In video 13, X had a particular value. It was 1%. This disease affects 1% of the population. The problem statement is to find the probability that a person actually has the disease, given that, if it is known that, the test says they have the disease, Okay, which is a little, little different than what's going on up here. Here we're saying the person is known to have the disease, and the test says, yes, they do. It confirms that they do have the disease when they already are known to have the disease. But this probability that we want to find is different. It's saying, okay, you don't know if you have the disease or not. The test comes back positive, saying, yes, you do. But maybe you don't. Maybe it's not a 100% chance that you do. It could be wrong. But that is a different probability, and the answer is not necessarily the same as TP. And in video 13, we saw that it was not the same as 95%. Okay? In addition, in this video, I want to do a graphical analysis of the solution. I want to represent the solution as a function of these three quantities, these three variables, TP, FP, and X. And I want to think about <clears throat> graphing that function and understanding the nature of the solution based on those graphs. So let's go ahead and discuss the solution. I need to use some laws from probability. 
in addition to the idea of a conditional probability. So if you don't know about those things, that's not gonna, this is not going to make complete sense to you. There's also some spe specialized notation that I'm using here. That's standard notation. But even if you don't know much probability, I hope again that you can still focus on the main big picture in terms of functional thinking and understanding what the solution, how to, how to understand the solution as the quantities change. So we're doing a, your typical kind of setup here in this sentence here. Let D be the event that a randomly chosen person has the disease. So D stands for disease. And let Y be the event that some the test comes back positive for a randomly chosen person. Y standing for yes. The test says you have a disease. Okay. In terms of the given variables that we have at the top, the TP, the FP, the X, TP being the probability of a true positive, FP being the probability of a false positive, and X being the probability that a person has the disease, we can write these equations here. This symbol here stands for what's called the conditional probability of Y given D. The vertical line means given or given that. We're saying if you are known to have the disease, if D has occurred, what are the chances that the test is going to come back positive? Yes, you do have the disease. That's what I call TP. That's a true positive. This probability symbol stands for <clears throat> the chances that if it is given that you do not have the disease. D prime stands for the complement of D, meaning you do not have the disease. What is the probability that the test comes back? Yes, positive. You do have the disease. That's a false positive, and that's what I'm calling FP. Those are called conditional probabilities. P of D is X. That's the probability that a randomly chosen person has the disease. And from a law and probability called the complement rule, we can also say the probability that you do not have the disease is 1 minus X. So again, in video 13, X was 1% or 0 0.01, and therefore the probability of not having the disease would be 0.99, 99%. That should make intuitive sense. The goal is we want to find another conditional probability, the probability of D given Y. If the test comes back, yes, you have the disease, do you really have it? What is the probability of D that you really have the disease? Okay. Uh, before I get into the solution, I want to show you a Venn diagram that is similar to the Venn diagram that I drew in video 13, except you can see it's an electronic version of it. This program that I'm showing here, by the way, is called Mathematica, and it's going to be what I use to make this picture for one thing and also make some other graphs that I can change as parameters change. Okay, so if you want to get some background on what this picture is, I will talk about it some here. You would want to watch video 13, but what I have here is I've got some sliders that represent the values of X, TP, and FP. X, again, is the probability that a randomly chosen person has the disease. And it's hard to see here, but what that 1% represents is really the area of this red rectangle over here that's barely visible underneath the green line here. It looks essentially like a red line, but it really is a red rectangle. Its area is 1% of the entire area of the box. Now, if I move the slider to the right, I can increase X, and you can see that that red box really gets bigger, and its, its area is what you see up at the top. So, for example, right now the area is 0.77, 77% of the entire area of the box, because there's a 0.77 right there. Okay, that's what X is. That's the probability that a randomly chosen person has the disease. Let me set it back to 0.01. Okay. Um, what do we see here? We see sliders for TP and FP. TP, again, is the probability of a true positive. It's 0.95. What was a true positive again? That's when somebody is known to have the disease and the test comes back and says, yes, you do have the disease. That's a 95% chance of that. What that number represents here in this picture is this green vertical green line is nine or rectangle actually is 95% of the area of the red rectangle. The red rectangle represents people who are known to have the disease. 95% of them, for 95% of them, the test comes back positive. So no matter what X is here, you can see that this green box here is 95% of the area of the red box, okay? But I can change TP to something else and make that percentage smaller or larger. And right here, for example, it's close to 40%. The area of this green box is close to 40% of the area of the red box, okay? Let's set it back to 0.95. And finally, we have FP down here. That stands for false positive. That's when people are known to not have the disease. They are in the set D prime, which really is everything outside of the red box, which is really everything over here. 
And this is the probability that the test comes back saying positive. Yes, you do have the disease, which is incorrect. That's a false positive. It's one half of 1%. So this little green line down here, which is again really a rectangle, is got an area one half of 1% of the entire area of this box right here to the right of the red rectangle. And I can increase FP and you can see that area, that relative area gets bigger. So for example, here it's close to 50% of the entire area of this box that's to the right of the red box. Okay, but I will again set it back to 0 0.005. The answer uh, to the question uh, that we want to find, the conditional probability of having the disease when, in, when the test comes back, yes, you do have the disease, is really a relative area. When it's coming back, yes, Y here, that's in green, that means you are in either this rectangle here, which again is real skinny, so it looks like a line, or this rectangle right here, which again is real skinny, so it looks like a line. You're wondering, <clears throat> out of the, the those two areas, what percentage of the, that total area is also part of the red, where, it's set, where you do actually have the disease. So it really is the ratio of the area of this skinny rectangle to the entire area of the L shape which is, looks like it's maybe close to a half. I mean, it's hard to tell because it's hard to tell exactly how skinny these things are. But it might look like it's close to about a half. The answer should be perhaps close to 0.5. Now, if I changed X and I changed TP and I changed FP, I'd get different answers. If I changed them to these values, for example, X is 0.11, TP is 0.821, FP is 0.561. The relative area of this rectangle compared to the area of the whole L shape is fairly small now. That looks like it might be on the order of about 0.1 or so. Okay, So this is a way to visualize what's going on as far as the answer goes. Now let's go through the solution. We still haven't gotten to the functions yet and graphing them. That comes later. Okay, So... Uh, we're going to use some rules of probability. First of all, something called the definition of conditional probability and the general multiplication rule. We can say this equation is true. Okay, I'll take it step by step here. This is the definition of conditional probability. The probability that you have diseased if it is known that the test comes back positive turns out to equal this ratio. This is the intersection symbol, which basically means and. This is the probability that you have the disease and the test comes back positive divided by the probability that the test comes back positive. Essentially, we are restricting what's called the sample space to something smaller. We're only considering those people for which the test comes back positive. In this picture, we're only considering the people or the area of the L here, which is a combination of these two skinny rectangles. That's what that ratio is saying. The next step right here is called the general multiplication rule. The probability of D and Y turns out to be this product right here, the conditional probability of Y given D times the probability of D. And that's a useful thing here because this, these two quantities are quantities that I'm given. This quantity is what I called TP, the chance of a true positive. This quantity is what I called X, the probability that a randomly chosen person has the disease. We're keeping this as a P of Y for the moment. Okay, So I've started to write the answer in terms of the variables, TP and X so far. But I still have this P of Y that I need to get in terms of TP, X, and perhaps FP. Okay, so that comes, we come next to something called the special addition rule for mutually exclusive events. Uh, y intersect D and Y intersect D prime are what are called mutually exclusive disjoint sets. They have no overlap, and that's because D and D prime can't occur at the same time. You either have the disease or you don't. D either occurs or D prime occurs. Furthermore, Y, uh, when the test comes back positive, is the union of these two things. One of these two things has to happen when the you know the test comes back positive. When that happens, you say they partition Y. That's a technical term. You don't need to worry about what it means. So the special addition rule says in this situation that P of Y, which is the same as P of this whole thing here, is the sum of two probabilities. These two probabilities are added together here. And once again, with the general multiplication rule can be used, uh, to figure out what those probabilities are equal to. This one, just like before, just like up here, is equal to this product. And this one, in a similar manner, is equal to this product, where the D is replaced by a D prime now. And now these quantities can be written in terms of our variables, T, P, X, and F, P, like this. Okay, And that gets us to our final answer. Putting all this together gives us our final answer, which looks like this. Okay. Um, that's the final answer, and that's a function of three variables. 
kind of a weird final answer. It's not a number. It's a function. I did that on purpose, okay? But now we want to understand this function to understand the solution to this general problem, to understand how to think about the solution of these infinitely many problems really all at once. And there are infinitely many of them because t, p, x, and f, p can be anything between 0 and 1, okay? Turns out in the video number 13 that the answer, p, for this probability is about 0.657. When you plug in these numbers, g, by the way, is the name of the function. I call it g just because I was looking for another letter to use. I plugged in 0.95 for tp, the probability of a true positive, 0 0.005 for fp, the probability of a false positive, and 0 0.01 for x, the probability that a randomly chosen person has the disease, and the answer is about 0.657. You should take the time to check that. Plug the numbers into this formula and see that you do get this answer. By the way, this uh, method that we used came up with a formula that's related to something called Bayes' theorem, and in future videos, starting with video number 15, I'm going to go back into Bayes' theorem and talk about it in a more general setting with a more kind of um, well, a more complicated problem, I should probably say. All right, so let's go ahead and do our graphical analysis. And in Mathematica, I'm going to I'm going to define the function with this code right here. And I can, for example, confirm the answer to video number 13. I can plug in those numbers into this function and get the answer of about 0.657. But I could plug in other numbers. You know, if uh, TP was 0.8 and FP was 0.1 and X was 0.2, I get a different answer. Okay? And, yeah, I mean, lots of different numbers, infinitely many different sets of numbers can give you infinitely many different answers. So what's the way to understand this? Graphing is the way to understand it, and perhaps using calculus if you want, but I'm not going to do that in this video. How do you graph it, though? Hmm. As a function of three variables, this is kind of a difficult function. It's a function of three variables, three independent variables, t, p, f, p, and x, and one dependent variable, p. Its true graph is a three-dimensional hypersurface or manifold is the technical name for it, sitting inside four-dimensional space. Oh, that already makes my head hurt. You can describe such a thing with set builder notation like this. It's a set of all four-dimensional points whose first coordinate is TP, whose second coordinate is FP, whose third coordinate is X, and whose fourth coordinate is the output for those numbers. As TP, FP, and X range between 0 and 1, and this is a subset of four-dimensional space. R4 stands for four-dimensional space, essentially. But how in the world can you visualize such a thing? Is it possible? Okay, I actually knew someone who tried to visualize such a thing once. He locked himself in a room for a whole day, and, uh, well, he came out at the end of the day and said, nope, I wasn't able to do it. He tried really hard, okay? Mere mortals cannot visualize such an object. So what do we do? Do we give up? No, you can still do math with things you can't completely visualize. Um, one thing we could do with this situation is we could look at what's called the contra map of it. It's level sets, which in this case are level surfaces. What are those? These are two-dimensional surfaces sitting inside three-dimensional spaces where this function is constant. So we think about different values of the output, p, different constant values, and we wonder what set of values, t, p, f, p, and x, inside three-dimensional space give you that output. For any given constant p between 0 and 1, we can look at the corresponding level set or level surface, uh, this set of points three-dimensional points, tp, fp, x, where the output equals p. Sometimes you'll see this kind of notation for it. This is called um, inverse image notation or pre-image notation. You see a g inverse there. That doesn't mean g is invertible. Um, this is just a notation for the set of all points, in this case in three-dimensional space, that get mapped to the value p. And if we look at how these surfaces change as p changes, we can gain an understanding of the behavior of the function g. Now, I'm not saying this is easy, but this is one thing you can attempt. Now, this is Mathematica code that will attempt to do this. But there is a lot of computation that goes on with this particular bit of code. <coughs> so it doesn't work in uh, the most efficient way possible here. I can, you can see p is set at 0 0.01 here initially. So we're wondering, this surface that you see here is the set of all points, set of all values, t, p, f, p, and x, where the answer to the problem, p, equals 1%, which is a pretty amazing thing when you think about it. I mean, that, that this test was supposed to be really good, perhaps. t, p might be close to 1, like 95%, 0.95, yet 
Even when Tp is close to 1, which would be over here on the right side of this graph, Tp is this, this axis here, so to speak, and Tp gets close to 1 when you move to the right here, there are points down there when x is small, close to 0, where the probability that you have the disease is very small, 1%. Okay, that's, that's pretty amazing. Now, as P increases, this surface changes. I can increase it to 2% here. Changes a little bit, not much. And again, there's a lot of computation going on here, so it's kind of slow in rendering. And I keep, keep increasing P. I can even slide it over here. And you see the surface changing to see the behavior of this function changing. And how would you describe the behavior in general? I, I think the general thing that I would say here is that basically the output of this function, the answer to the problem, p, definitely increases as x increases. Sort of the main feature that you see changing in this surface as p increases is that it's moving upwards, where x increases. x again represented the probability that a randomly chosen person in the population has the disease. So as the, the answer gets larger, that corresponds to a larger value of x. But again, the interesting point to me here is that the answer can be very small even if Tp is very large. Even if you're over on the right side of this graph, you can have for a small x, a small uh, percentage of the population having the disease, you can have a small probability that you have the disease even when the test comes back positive. That's a lot to think about. You might want to re rewind that and listen to it again. Okay, That's what I kind of emphasize here. Note that the answer is close to the value. Uh, the answer for the value of p can be close to zero, 0 0.01, for example, even when tp is close to one, as long as x is close to zero. So when when this disease is real rare, okay, when x is real small, that means the disease is real rare. Then the answer for you having the disease when the test comes back positive can still be small. So that's good news, I guess. If it's a rare disease, even when tp is large. It's, you still might not have the disease. There's still a very good chance that you don't have the disease. Okay, that's a little hard to understand. Is there an easier method? There is easier to understand and also takes less rendering time in Mathematica in, if instead we graph this thing as a function of one of these variables at a time. How can you do that if there's three variables? Well, what we do is we allow the other two variables to be viewed as what I call parameters that produce changes in the graph as they vary. So we're gonna get one graph uh, as a function of one variable, an ordinary kind of graph. However, we can change the values of the other variables and get different graphs. So what you see here is the graph of this function as a function of just x. So this horizontal axis is labeled with an x. p is the vertical axis, it's the answer to the problem. tp is set to 0.95 and fp is set to 0 0.005 just like in video number 13. The black dot represents the answer to video number 13. When x is 1%, 0 0.01, the output here you can see is about 0 0.657, I think was the answer. Okay, It's increasing as x increases. We saw that already just a minute ago in that three-dimensional picture. As the proportion of the population that has the disease increases, the answer increases. On the flip side, as the proportion x, the probability of having the disease, goes down towards zero, this answer goes towards zero, just like we saw P when p was 0 0.01 in that three-dimensional graph. How do tp and fp affect things? If tp goes down, this whole graph goes downward. Okay. If the true pro positive probability is low, meaning it's a really bad test, then when it says you have the disease, uh, the probability that you actually do have the disease is going to be lower. So I guess that makes intuitive sense. If TP were at the other extreme, 1, 100% 1, accuracy, meaning if you're known to have the disease, it will definitely say you have the disease, you still have hope even if it comes back positive. The probability of having the disease when it says yes is not equal to 1, even though this is equal to 1. It still has the same behavior as when it was 0.95. You could still have a, a fairly low probability, at least, again, if it's a very rare disease. How about FP? How does that affect the, thing, the graph? As it goes up, the graph goes down. As, that's sort of the flip side with TP. As TP went down, the graph went down. And as FP goes up, the graph goes down. That should make intuitive sense. False positives means it's bad in another way. It's saying you have the disease when you really don't. Uh, so when that's large in value, your, your graph goes down, which is good for you in terms of not having the disease. And if TP and F is low and FP is 
large, then there's almost no chance you have the disease um, unless the disease is really, really prominent, unless X is close to 1. Okay. Once again, note that the answer for P can be close to 0 even when P TP is close to 1 as long as X is close to 0. Okay, that's the, those are the main points I wanted to make in this video. I got a couple other graphs here to show you, and I'm gonna then I'm gonna show you my website, infinityisreallybig.com that I showed you at the beginning, where I where I emphasize these kinds of themes a lot. Um, so this here, what I'm doing here is I'm graphing the answer as a function of TP instead of x. X is set to 0.01, FP is set to 0.005, and I can think about how this changes as X and FP increase. As X increases, the grass goes up. The prevalence of the disease in the population is going up. As FP increases, the graph goes down, just like we saw with the other graph. Okay, And the final graph we can look at is the graph of this function as a function of T FP. And the flip thing is happening. This is a decreasing function instead of an increasing function. As FP, false positive probability goes up, the probability that you actually have the disease goes down. Okay, And again, as X increases, this graph goes up. And as TP uh, decreases, the graph goes down. And as TP increases, it goes back up again. Okay, So you should think about the meaning of those things. So again, like I promised with the little note at the beginning of the video, I want to end just by showing you my blog, infinityisreallybig.com, where I do lots of things similar to this. I talk about a lot of math, and I make lots of graphs that are animated graphs like this. In a lot of recent posts here in April of 2019, I've been talking about what are called survival mo models in actuarial science. It's a pretty advanced topic, some pretty advanced probability. Um, so to truly understand what's going on here in these particular posts, you'd have to understand probability pretty deeply. But let me just show you that I've got some interesting graphs uh, that are animated, for example. Um, I've got some static graphs as well, but I do have some animated graphs in here showing you what happens as parameter cha parameters change uh, you'll find this kind of thing all through my blog in various kinds of situations. Again, the content of these particular posts is pretty complicated. I do have uh, more basic things in various spots as well. I've got algebra and pre-calculus related posts and calculus related posts. Not every post has an animation in it, but I do try to make a lot of animations in a lot of my posts. So if you like this kind of thing, I'd encourage you to visit infinityisreallybig.com. Thanks for watching.